So good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope I am audible. Uh, yes, audible. Yes. Thank you, thank you. I am Dr. Larencia Mishasian, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, Open City College, and I will be hosting this program. I wish a warm welcome to all the dignitaries, experts, and participants present here tonight. Our program tonight is Capacity Building on Climate Change and Planned Biodiversity, which is jointly organized by Mizoram State Climate Change Cell, Mizoram Science, Technology, and Innovation Council, MISTIC, Directorate of Science and Technology, Government of Mizoram, and by the Department of Botany, Government, Safety College. Uh, this is an information for all participants uh, that we will be putting up the link for registration in order to get the e-certificate for this webinar during the program. So I request you to kindly stay tuned. The Mizoram State Climate Change Cell has been conducting capacity building and awareness programs to different levels of government in the state academics, research, scholars, students, NGOs, and so on. And likely our audience tonight includes researchers, college and university students, academicians, uh, and so on. And it is truly a great privilege for all of us to be able to meet online in one platform and participate in such an important program with two very proficient resource persons. So let me give out the order of program for tonight. First of all, uh, there will be a welcome address delivered by Pooh Lesom Liana, Chief Scientific Officer and Member Secretary, Mystic Government of Mizoram. After which, um, we shall call the first resource person, Dr. Bharat Kumar Pradhan, to give his presentation, which will be followed by um, a presentation from our second resource person for tonight, that is Dr. Manish Kumar. So kindly note that I will be giving an introduction on our esteemed resource persons prior to their presentations, respectively. There will be a time for interaction after board resource persons have used up their time, and I request all the participants to actively participate in this interaction. You may um, kindly put up your queries if you have any queries, you can put it up in the chat box or you may unmute yourself, uh, turn on your video and you, you may directly interact with our experts also. So let's make the best use of our opportunities tonight. We will be ending this program with concluding remarks by Pu Samuel Lelmel Soma, Senior Scientific Officer, Mystic. I shall now request, respected sir, Pu H. Nelson Liana, Chief Scientific Officer and Member Secretary, Mystic, Government of Mizoram, to deliver a welcome speech. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lawrence C. Mishrasel. I'll uh, straight away start my address. Respected additional PCCF administration and nodal officer, Climate Change, Environment, Forest, and Climate Change Department, Government of Mizoram, Resource Person, Dr. Manish Kumar, Assistant Professor, Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar College, Dr. Bharat Pradhan, Scientific Associate, Sikkim, Biodiversity Board, Forest and Environment Department, Government of Sikkim, faculties, student and research scholars from Science Department of Mizoram Universities and different colleges, different science NGOs, and my dear colleagues, I extend a warm, welco a warm welcome to tonight's capacity building programs on climate change and plant biodiversity organized by State Climate Change Shell. Mizoram Science, Technology and Innovation Council in collaboration with Department of Botany, Government Search College. The Mizoram State Climate Change Shell was created six, <clears throat> seven years ago on 25th November 2014 with the financial support from Strategic Program Large Initiative Coordinated Action Enablers known as SPLICE and Climate Change Program 
of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, through the national mission for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem of national action plans on climate change. The Mizoram State Climate Change Shale has been functioning under the aegis of Mizoram Science, Technology and Innovation Council, MISTIC, Directorate of Science and Technology, Government of Mizoram. The sale concentrates in implementations of its own project objective while meeting the requirement of the <clears throat> missions objective of the NMSHE under the National Action Plans on Climate Change, Government of India. Simultaneously, the Mizoram State Climate Change Shells has been given the responsibility of a leading role by Government of Mizoram to implement the mission's objective of the Strategic Knowledge Mission, SKM, under the Mizoram State Action Plans on Climate Change. Since its inception, the State Climate Change Shells of Mizoram under Mizoram Science, Technology and Innovation Council has been working towards understanding the science of climate change, its impacts, risks, and <clears throat> vulnerabilities of different sectors to climate change. At the same time, we have also conducted a number of activities such as capacity building, training, and awareness programs for different stakeholders, especially for adaptation studies, strategies in response to climate change for integrations into developmental activities by including policymakers, concerned departments, other government officials, academicians, media, NGOs, students, and the local mass. The project phase one, which was completed in the year 2019, was the pioneer in the state, the climate science research, and will continue to do so in phase two which has started in 2021 to meet the requirement of the underlying objective of the national missions for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem. Various activities have been proposed. In this regard, tonight's capacity building program on climate change and plant biodiversity is organized as part of the activities for phase two. Climate change is an area of science that has been studied for many years, yet <clears throat> there are many things we do not understand and some of the questions that remain before us may have a significant impact on the quality of our lives in the future. Tonight, we are <clears throat> fortunate enough to have with us Dr. Manish Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Studies, Dr. Bimram Ambedkar College, University of Delhi, and Dr. Bharat Pradhan, Scientific Technical Associate, Sikkim Biodiversity Board, Forest and Environment Department, Government of Sikkim, to share their valuable inputs and research experience on the topic relating to climate change and plant biodiversity. I hope that this program will be <clears throat> a fruitful and beneficial for all participants, especially in future research and related to climate change. I wish all the participants good luck. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, moving on with our program, we shall now call upon Dr. Bharat Kumar Pradhan to give his presentation. Dr. Pradhan is a Scientific Technical Associate in Sikkim Biodiversity Board, Forest and Environment Department, Government of Sikkim. He is a member of IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and a community leader in Friends for Future International Germany. So Dr. Pradhan, if, uh, if you are ready, the time is yours.
Uh, Dr. Pradhan, are you there? You must be having some technical issue. Uh, dear participants, kindly bear with us. Our resource person, um, <coughs> I think he's having some technical problem. Uh, let's uh, wait for a while. Am I audible? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. You are audible. I'm audible, no? right? Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for the technical error issue. Okay. okay. Uh, good good evening, uh, friends. Good evening, friends. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very important webinar on climate change. Uh, we all know that the world is at war, but this time the war is not between the two countries or for borders. Neither it is between the West and South. The global war is against the climate change and we all are into it because it is affecting each one of us and it will affect our children and would be children too. So we need to bring the topic to discussion and start developing future strategies to protect our children from the devastating impact of climate change. <clears throat> if you see in this chart, the global average temperature from 1850 to 2020, there has been a sharp increase in the global average temperature. Today, if we switch on the television, what could we see? There will be the news of social unrest everywhere. There will be the news of large tract of forest being cut it into fire land being flooded with water and the villages being devastated by the cyclones, which are all due to the impact of climate change. The climate change is affecting the food production, causing severe water stress. It is pushing the humanity towards poverty and hunger, due to which people are forced to migrate as a climate refugee to other areas to escape the extreme climate disaster where it is resulting in armed conflict as can be witnessed in Somalia. Arab Springs, the war in Syria and the Boko Haram terrorist insurgency in Nigeria all have been big factors in refugee crisis. In the Southeast alone, 80 million people have moved to Europe, uh, Middle East and North America. If we see the migration data about uh, between 2008 and 2015, 21.5 million people were displaced due to climate disaster. In 2017, 68.5 million people were displaced and as per the International Organization on Migration, there could be as many as 200 million climate refugees by 2050 of which 143 million would be from three regions of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, and South Asia. Look at the map. You will not see any place on earth not being affected by climate change. The decade 2011 to 20 had been the hottest decade. The temperature crossed 50 degrees Celsius in some parts of the world. World Meteorological Organization confirmed year 2020 to be the hottest year. The average global temperature in 2020 was about 14 degrees Celsius, which is 1.2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. 
entire globe witnessed the climate anomalies and events in 2020. According to the Europe Space Agency, 4 million square kilometers of Earth's land is affected by forest fires every year. The world is facing unprecedented level of drought. Women are forced to walk long distances for collecting water. Our glaciers are melting. We have lost about 5,340 gigaton of ice over the last two decades, and the total loss is accelerating at the rate of 48 gigaton per year. Many parts of the world are flooded. July this year only brought a seemingly endless round of flood disaster across the world. 124 flood events across 385 locations in more than 20 countries, including India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Iran, US, Europe, Yemen, Japan, etc., were witnessed. Countries like Australia, New Zealand, and Oceania <clears throat> were also devastated by. So climate change is no longer a future problem, but it is the problem of now. It is the present uh, problem. So here comes the question, what is the root cause for the climate change? The answer is, it is the global warming and the cause is the unsustainable human activities. Human population is growing exponentially, which is resulting in deforestation for agriculture, urbanization, etc., over exploitation of natural resources. Rapid industrialization to meet the increasing need of the human population is spewing pollutants and greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is depleting the ozone layer as well as causing greenhouse effect, thus resulting in global warming. And the repercussion is the climate-driven disasters due to climate change. Our unsustainable activities are pushing the earth towards sixth mass mass extinction. If we glance into the future, it is expected that the number of climate refugees is likely to triple by 2100. The air could be thick with pollution, worsening the lung condition, causing respiratory diseases. More than half of the world's population may not have adequate access to water because all our glaciers the source of fresh water will melt. The type of fish we eat could become extinct due to the warming of the seas and the ocean water. Millions of people would be without food as the world will witness poverty and hunger due to stress caused due to climate change. The rainforest, which is considered as the lungs of the earth could face total annihilation. Superbugs could kill 10 million people every year. Due to melting of glaciers and permafrost, the dormant viruses and bacteria that had remained buried under the glaciers for millions of years are becoming slowly active, and we do not know how deadly those viruses and bacteria would be. They may have potential to wipe out the entire humanity from this planet Earth. Due to pollution and warming, diseases will spread easily and the number of people number of people living with uh, dementia will like likely triple hurricanes sand storms dust storms thunderstorm would become more frequent and there will be large scale blackouts due to pollution which will have direct impact on the food production system all the coastal areas including shanghai tokyo Bangladesh, some coastal areas in India like West Bengal, Odisha, Kerala, Karnataka, Goa, Maharashtra will get submerged. Even the Himalayas would witness the havoc due to climate change. Flash floods have become common in Himalayan states like Sikkim. Every year we face uh, this kind of situation and not only in Sikkim but in Uttarakhand also. Recently, we witnessed avalanche in Mustang in Nepal, and it is due to climate change. Our glaciers are turning back due to setting, settling up of pollutant released from the industries and the vehicles, which is 
accelerating the process of glacial melt. It's all warming the planet even faster than the carbon dioxide. If we talk about Sikkim, over 1600 yak died in 2018, which is associated with the climate vortex. Studies have revealed that Himalayan states would face imminent water crisis. The resource exertion would compel the people to migrate to other places, and there will be competition for resources, which will give rise to conflict, ultimately leading to displacement of the original mountain inhabitants. The world leader placed in Paris in 2015 that they would make an make a coordinated effort to limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius and preferably below 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century during COP1 of UN United Nations framework on framework convention on climate change. But the earth is hitting on a world of climate promise not yet delivered, which force the youths to organize climate strike to remind us about our promises. They started the movement like Friday for Future to seek climate justice, but they are being tagged as anti-social, anti-development and terrorist by some of the selfish leaders of the developed nation. We need to understand that our children do not need our money. They need, they need food to eat clean air to breathe and our clean, pure water to drink. We must ensure food security and environment security to our future generations. The COP26 or the Glasgow Climate Conference of November 2021 is a total failure as it was not able to meet the aspiration of the future generations who are fighting for climate justice. We need to become carbon neutral by 2050 for which we need to completely phase out the use of fossil fuel, but the COP26 failed us and the future generations as it was not able to convince the world leaders in phasing out the use of coal completely. Rather, by the end of the, end of the conference, the phase out term was changed to replaced with phase down. With such fake promises, the temperature of the earth will exceed three degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and that will be the end of the world. There is not only the need to reduce the carbon emission, but also we need to remove the carbon present in the atmosphere, for which many countries are installing carbon scrubbers, but that is not feasible all the time. They are trying to cover the glaciers with the uh, uh, white blankets, but I don't think it will be uh, uh, possible all the time. There is not only the need to reduce the carbon emission, but also we need to remove carbon in the atmosphere. The only solution to it is the restoration of the ecosystem. Where whether it be forest or rivers. The decade 2021 to 2030 have been declared as the decade of ecosystem restorations and we have last chance to protect our planet. If we miss this, then our future generation will never forgive us. In Sikkim, if we talk about Sikkim, our forests are well protected, but the rivers need our attention. And I am running a campaign restore river ecosystem to drive the attention of the policymakers towards our diminishing rivers. Apart from this, we also have our individual responsibility towards our mind. These are some of the things which if we put up in practice in our daily lives, I think it would definitely make a difference. For example, now we only we prefer to travel by the private taxi, but now we need to we need to make a habit to travel by a public mode of transport or shared taxi. By doing so, we will be uh, we will be will have will be contributing towards environment protection, such as there will be no resource exertion there will be no uh, spewing of the pollutants into the environment 
and moreover we will be helping and helping the uh, person in provide uh, earning a sustainable livelihood for himself and for his uh, family and then we need to maintain greeneries we no, need not do anything we need not do anything but you know, just maintain whatever whatever we have in our surroundings by doing so then this will be a great contribution towards environment protection then garbage is a major problem these days now we need to reduce it we can we take the examples of the scandinavian countries where there is zero garbage there is no garbage we can also become the scandinavian countries but we need to put a coordinated effort coordinated effort now now for also, uh, we shouldn't be burning the garbage because uh, by burning the garbage, it is releasing uh, carbon into the atmosphere, and that is the main cause for global warming. Then again, we need to do the source segregation of the garbage, and food wastage is a major problem in our country. We waste the food, but think of those people who can afford a one-time meal for his family. Think of those um, uh, uh, farmers putting and out without you know uh, considering the um, uh, harsh climatic condition so think of those people and don't waste the food just cook only that much which you can eat and also we can avoid everyone should avoid buying plastic products because plastics have been a major pro plastics are causing a uh, major pollution now plastic has become a global problem so we need to avoid buying plastic products and reduce and reuse the uh, polythene bags uh, then we can um, uh, uh, eat less packaged food. Then um, now, these days, the online shopping ha habit has become a craze. Now we need to uh, change our consumeristic behavior. We we should we need to control our shopping habit. Buy only those things which are of utmost necessary. Don't buy and just um, uh, you know uh, keep it like that because um, if you buy and if it is not of use then it's just a wastage of resources and then of course we can um, uh, instead of uh, buying this uh, mineral bottled water let us uh, have our own steel carry our own steel bottle so because one uh, plastic bottle takes thousand years to disintegrate and during that time it uh, uh, releases uh, pollution pollutants uh, into the atmosphere then again uh, then we can go paperless if we go paperless it's then we will be um, uh, uh, protecting the trees so these are the uh, things uh, which we should be, if we put it in practice in our daily life, then I think it will make a it will make a great difference. For me, being a climate advocate, I'm constantly raising my voice and generating awareness through my writings, etc. These are some of my writings on climate change climate change, which are published in uh, this uh, Panda newsletter, an annual publication of the Forest and Environment Department, Sikkim. If anyone is interested, I would love to share this with you all. I am also running a campaign like, uh, this is also my, my earlier publications on the same magazine. It's a, an annual magazine. And uh, then if anyone is interested, uh, I would love to share it. And I'm also running a campaign like Save Indigenous, Save Rivers, Save Future bridging the intergenerational gap because the intergenerational gap is uh, increasing and this is the main problem so you can also be a part of it with these words i would like to end my uh, presentation with an appeal let us join hand in making this planet a beautiful place to live in for us and for our future generations once again, I would like to thank the organizers for making me a part of this event. And I do hope that I could do full justice to the invitation. Thank you and good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, we would be happy if you could uh, share us the publications that you have. Uh, with us, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, even our you can, if you can provide me with the email ID, I would love to share this, share my writings. Okay, sir. Uh, our students will be very interested in that. And with the campaign that you are uh, taking up, it's uh, really a good, um, good thing. So uh, I wish you all the best for that. 
and we thank you for your interesting and informative presentation. We appreciate the time that you took to make this program a success and uh, we hope you will be with us till the interaction time. So um, until that, uh, we hope you don't leave us behind. Okay, okay so... I will try my best because the network is very poor this side. So uh, okay. let us hope that, uh, you know, it remains good. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir. Um, now we shall move on to the next program. Uh, we will be um, calling upon the next uh, resource person, Dr. Kumar Manish. Uh, he is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Studies, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar College, University of Delhi. Uh, I will just read out a few um, a few lines from his bio data. He, uh, his broad area of research is climate change, biodiversity, con conservation, ecology, evolution, and biostatistics. He was awarded Rai Kedarnath Gold Medal for securing second position in BSc Botany Honors in University of Delhi. And he is also a gold medalist for securing first position in MSc Environmental Studies in University of Delhi. He was also awarded DST Inspire research fellowship for pursuing his doctoral research at the university of delhi till date he has published uh, 14 research papers in peer-reviewed international journals that have received 531 citations along with six poster presentations and four oral presentations at some of the leading international universities such as harvard royal botanical gardens etc so um so, Dr. Manish, if you are ready, the time is open for you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. And uh, good evening to all the participants. Uh, thank you for providing me with this opportunity uh, of sharing my work with you all. I hope I do justice to whatever, uh, you know, uh, to the time which you are giving me. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Pradhan, for your insight lecture. You have uh, given a prelude of what actually um, um, is happening and what kind of challenges we are facing in the Himalayan ecosystem. Um, Earth as a whole, but uh, typically Himalaya, because Himalaya is warming almost uh, three times. Uh, uh, it's warming at the rate three times that of the global average. So if you see the global average, Himalayas are warming much faster. And we all know that it's referred to as the third pole. So if this sort of warming happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, the future of this country depends upon the Himalayas. So it's very important to conserve it. It's very important to do something about it. Uh, let's hope our policymakers take the right decision at the right time. So uh, I will just uh, uh, give you an insight on the works which I have did. And these have been actually the works which uh, I did for my PhD. So uh, I did my bachelor's in botany, but actually uh, I'm more of a biostatistician. So I do more of ecological modeling and all that sort of stuff. I use data for species, but that data is just to serve as the input for looking into the bigger picture. And we all know that uh, uh, there is something which uh, 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 is going on in the Himalaya, but we actually forget that Himalaya has actually, the plant biodiversity which you see in the Himalaya, it has actually been the result of this climatic changes which has been going on since uh, a long period of time, since uh, the time of uh, inception of Himalaya, almost 55 million years ago. So uh, my objective today is to make you, uh, to give an insight of what actually has happened in the past what is happening at present in the Himalaya with respect to plant bed diversity and what will happen in the future. So uh, these are two beautiful photographs. We all uh, know that these are rhododendrons. On the left-hand side, you see rhododendrons, and on the right-hand side, you see anthropology. So uh, remarkable diversity of rhododendrons and uh, these beautiful species also are, uh, you know, uh, at uh, loss due to uh, climate change in the Himalaya. So just to give a prelude, the story starts way back around 180 million years ago when India was part of Gondwana, a supercontinent. So uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, India was aligned with Australia, Antarctica, South Africa, and Africa. Then 
plate tectonics started to happen around 20, 120 million years ago. India, along with Madagascar and Seychelles, got detached from Antarctica. Around 80 million years ago, uh, Madagascar got uh, detached from India. And like this, India was traveling along the proto-Indian Ocean, what we call it. Uh, 65 million years ago, Seychelles also separated from the Himalaya. And around 55 million years ago, India was hit about to hit Eurasia. Now, scientific data indicates that actually, uh, for any landmass ever in Earth's history, India has migrated at the largest speed. So now that speed was almost like five centimeter per year or something. But still, that has been the largest speed which has been recorded for any tectonic plate in Earth's history. 40 million years ago, boom, India collided with Eurasia. And the Tethys Sea, which was there at present, the result of this intercontinental collision was such that the Tethys Sea got drained out and the sediments which were out there they arose in the form of Himalaya. So, result was the largest and the youngest mountain chain of the world, which we call Himalaya, abode of the snow. Him and Alia. Him means snow, Alia means home. So, it's source of almost seven major rivers around the world. It's spread across five countries and it's referred to as third pole because apart from Arctic and Antarctica, Himalaya has the largest repository of ice deposits. You will see a whole lot of the highest mountain chains like that of Mount Everest or Kanchenjunga in the Himalaya. Now, turning to uh, the remarkable plant biodiversity which we have in the Himalaya, so we have almost like 4,000 endemic species in the Himalaya. And if you see the affinities of these species, you will come to know that some have affinities toward the Southeast Asian regions, typically the Eastern Himalaya, and some have affinity towards the temperate regions of Europe. The question arises, how come a mountain system, which is so young, I mean, only 40, 50 million years ago, it was conceived, how comes it has become a repository of almost 4,000 endemic species? Because as botanists and as environmental scientists, we all know, having species diversity is something different from having endemic diversity. If you're having endemism, then that means you're having remarkable rates of speciation. So how come Himalaya has this rate? So how come the research questions which were there in front of me when I started my PhD was within a gap 50 to 40 million years ago, how come this mountain system has 30 to 40% plant endism? There are about 10,000 species in the Himalaya, plant species, out of which 30 to 40% are endemic. And if this has been the case, since the time of its inspection, since Pliocene, a uh, Pliogene, what have been the major time periods in which the species in which these species have di diversified has the rate been constant have the species been diversifying at constant rate throughout the time period or have there been any periods of ups and down in the himalaya what have been the source of these species because when there was no himalaya there was ocean tethys sea so if tethys sea was there then that means somewhere from somewhere the species might have come what are the sources of those species? And I was surprised to know that normally Diptyocarpaceae, right? So we say that Diptyocarpaceae uh, has come from Southeast Asia into India via the Himalaya, via Assam, uh, uh, the Raj Mahal gap which we have in the Himalaya. But the phylogenetic evidence provides a contrary theory. Phylogenetic evidence, which was uh, uh, given by the a group of authors led by S. Dayanandan, they said that no, diptyocarpaceae has not come from uh, Southeast Asia, what the uh, paleobotanists say. It has actually come from Gondwana. So it was present, diptyocarpaceae was present in Gondwana. And while India was migrating after the breakup of Gondwana, it has come along with that to India. So that means the fossil and phylogenetic evidence are not coherent. 
somebody is seeing uh, some other picture and some other group is seeing some other pictures. Right. The second research question, this is the present day uh, Himalayan biodiversity in the Himalaya. So we have actually a minor gap of 100 to 200 meters between the various ecosystem in the Eastern and Western Himalaya. Eastern Himalaya would include Northeast India and Sikkim and Western Himalaya would include the states of Jammu Kashmir, uh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand. So uh, if you see, actually the tree lines are slightly above in the Eastern Himalaya as compared to the Western Himalaya, uh, predominantly because of the monsoons which happen in the Northeast India. So, if this is the present structure, then what will happen to the future? Will the future change for the plant biodiversity? Uh, on the lower pane of the, uh, uh, of the uh, image which you have, the primulas which we have, the rhododendrons which we have, the mechanopsis which we have in Northeast India, which is so beautiful, will they be replaced by exotic species which are present on the upper panel, like the conizas and ageratum? What will be the likely picture of Galtheya for that? See. So, uh, Dr. Pradhan has highlighted that climate change is happening in the Himalaya, and we have evidence for this. Uh, climate is actually climate change is actually happening at a very rapid pace. Warming is happening at a very rapid pace in the Himalaya throughout the length and breadth of the Himalaya. So, uh, uh, Sreshta et al. 2012 said that Himalayas are warming at three times the rate of the global average. Uh, Ilwala et al. said that actually due to climate change, species are climbing up in the Himalaya. So, downward species are moving up. And Brand et al. in the study from, uh, on, uh, from the Tibet Himalaya said that actually it is the uh, shrubs which will likely gain uh, uh, which will be at an advantage in the future circumstances. So we have the past, we have the present, we have the future. So what actually is going on in the Himalaya? So with this, I started my PhD here at Delhi University. And the first objective was, what has, uh, was to look into the matter of the past. What actually has resulted uh, in such an enormous biodiversity in the Himalaya? So, uh, for this, uh, what I did was that I went on field studies and I uh, collected data for species which are uh, located in the Himalaya. So, after two years, uh, we, have given, uh, we are given five years as per UGC to complete a PhD, but after two years, I felt that this time would not be sufficient enough for collection. So then I started relying on, I was doing field studies simultaneously because unless you go to the Himalaya, you will not arrive at uh, the real picture, what actually is there. So I was conducting field studies, but side by side, I was also conducting literature-based studies of flora, of the regional floras, of the online databases, uh, so as to record how many species are there. And then I classified them into the Eastern Himalayan endemic and Western Himalayan endemic. Then I did a bit of ecological modeling to make phylogenetic trees and do ancestral layer reconstructions. So these were my actually sampling sites in the Himalaya. So 132 sampling sites. Out of that, the most sampling site you will see in Sikkim. So uh, in Sikkim, the sites have uh, actually sampled by my colleagues at Delhi University. Uh, we did a large project called as carrying capacity study of Tista Basin in Sikkim, which was awarded to my supervisor. So uh, the sampling sites which you see in Sikkim are the result of uh, are the sites which have been sampled by my colleagues. I was involved in sampling the other sites which you see over here in the Eastern and Western Himalaya. Of course, I went to Sikkim, but uh, uh, the sampling sites uh, represent a cumulative uh, total of all the sites. Uh, so I employed two kinds of designs to sample the, uh, the vegetation. I used a nested coordinate method. So at the lower elevations, since the vegetation is quite dense over there, I used 10 meter by 10 meter coordinates in which I sampled tree. Within that uh, coordinate, uh, 10 meter into 10 meter coordinate, I had 5 meter into 5 meter coordinate where I sampled shrubs and climbers. And within that, I had uh, one meter into one meter at the upper elevation since vegetation is not dense over there 
And if I were to employ 10 meter by 10 meter cordate, then it would have entailed a very large amount of sampling. So I used a Nesse cordate method, which is called as modified Bittica plot. So it was 1000 meter square cordate. So these are the designs which I used. And I sampled across the entire range of ecosystems. So tropical, temperate, subalpine, and alpine. Uh, this is from the Siang Valley, which you see the picture from tropical. Temperate to present the uh, Himachal Pradesh area of uh, uh, Manali. The subalpine represents the Valley of Flowers National Park. So this picture is from Valley of Flowers National Park. And the alpine areas represent the Nanda Devi Barasphere Reserves. So these were the things which I did. And then, of course, uh, I relied on the published information, already published information. I used softwares for constructing my phylogenetic tree. And such was the result. No, if I, this was the entire phylogenetic tree. But if I zoom a portion, my tree looks something like this. So I recorded the diversification times family-wise. Uh, since they were about uh, 3,020 uh, Eastern Himalayan endemics. So uh, instead of going into the species uh, diversification, I went for the family diversifications. And the node ages which you see over here, they actually present the diversification time. Similarly, this was for the Western Himalayan endemic. So two separate categories were made. And then I uh, tried to analyze what was happening uh, after getting the diversification time of the families, then I was seeing what was happening. And the results were very, very interesting. And this was published in 2021 in Modeling Earth System and Environment. In Western Himalaya, there have been periods of ups and down for family diversification. One spot which you will see, that you will see around 40 million years ago in Western Himalaya. Another period of rapid diversification in the East Western Himalaya we'll see at 30 million years ago. And then, I'm sorry. Uh, right. So, uh, one you would see at 30 million years ago, uh, 40 million years ago, the second diversification uh, uh, peak you will see in Western Himalaya at 30 million years ago and the third at 20 million years ago. But in Eastern Himalaya, the rates of diversification have been constant. And if you take a ratio, you would come to know that maximum species in the Himalaya have diversified actually around 40 uh, to 45 million years ago. 30 to 35 million years ago and 20 to 25 million years ago. Now, the picture becomes more clear when we have this kind of graph. Both in Eastern and Western Himalaya, maximum species have diversified between 35 to 20 million years ago. So, what is happening? After, before 35 to 20 million years ago and after 35 to 20 million years ago, diversification rates have dropped. And if you look at literature, actually 35 to 20 million years ago was the time when monsoon originated in the Himalaya. So that means whatever diversified species which we have, whatever plant diversity which we have, it's actually a result of monsoons in the Himalaya. The moment monsoon originated in the Himalaya, the species started to diversify. So actually what happened was when monsoon started, you had a lot of soil erosion, you, rivers were formed, you had a lot of fluvial erosion. So that created a kind of situation in which Himalaya from a continuous habitat was transformed into series of dissected valleys with a lot of pockets, uh, um, isolated pockets. And that promoted species diversification. So whatever was present, uh, you had now isolated topograph, uh, topographic habitats, you had habitat heterogeneity, and all of these contributed towards species diversification. Then I did some ancestral area reconstructions. So these were the phylogenetic trees for them. And uh, again, for the Eastern and Western Himalaya, uh, we had the, uh, I prepared the phylogenetic trees for ancestral area reconstructions. But what actually was very interesting, 
just give me a second. Yeah. So for the Eastern Himalaya, when I uh, uh, calculated the nodes percentage, I came to know that maximum species, God knows, uh, just wait a second. Yeah. So let us go like this. Uh, maximum species in the Eastern Himalaya have come from South Asiatic region, South Chinese region, and Sino Japanese region. Whereas, if you go to the Western Himalaya, the situation becomes opposite. Maximum species in Western Himalaya have come from Southeast Chinese region, Sino Japanese region, Iran, that means Europe comes into picture, and then you have the Central Asiatic region. So both the regions of Himalaya are very different in terms of their composition. In Eastern Himalaya, you see a predominance of species coming from the Southeast Asian regions. Whereas in the Western Himalaya, maximum species are temperate species, which have come from China, Japan, Central Asia, and the European regions. So this was a remarkable thing which we found out. Uh, the most important point which was uh, which uh, we came to know, the first point was monsoons are responsible. Monsoons have been responsible for evolution of such a remarkable plant diversity in the Himalaya. The second main uh, uh, summary from this study was that in Eastern Himalaya, it's Southeast Asia which has fed the species into the Himalaya. And in Western Himalaya, it's actually the Southeast, uh, the, uh, the uh, Southeast China, Sino-Japanese, and the European elements which have fed species into the Himalaya. Now, once uh, 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 the picture was clear, then I attempted to document what was the present-day biodiversity. What is the structure of present-day biodiversity in the Himalaya? So again, the same methods which I use. And uh, the study area which we chose was Sikkim. And uh, the advantage with me uh, for selecting the study was uh, maximum of these sites were already sampled. So we had a huge uh, data collected over five years uh, from this state. So uh, uh, I, then took, uh, I then took that data and tried to analyze what was actually the present day structure of vegetation in the Himalaya. And Sikkim was an ideal, Sikkim is an ideal state in many senses. Uh, in, uh, in short, what I intend to say uh, that if you start from the lowest most, uh, low most point of Sikkim, Malli Bajar, so that starts somewhere around 213 meters. And then you can cover the entire gradation of ecosystem within a matter of 100 kilometers. So you can go from the tropical to the alpine regions within 100 kilometers. It's such a friendly state that you will find no, uh, you know, uh, problems while doing any kind of study. Therefore, uh, uh, it's an ideal state where you should do your study. So it has gradation of tropical, temperate, alpine, subalpine, everything you will find within a short geographical distance of 100 kilometers. So again, the same sampling strategy was followed. At the lower elevations, we employed uh, the necessary coordinate method of 10 meter by 10 meter. And at the upper end, we employed the coordinates of uh, 20 meter by 15 meter. Right? So uh, these were the uh, various kind of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, life forms which we sampled. We sampled trees, shrubs, climbers, and herbs. So this is Ficus glomerata. I think uh, this is Zoja cerasea, uh, Clematis cronita, and then uh, we have Potentilla. So if you go to Sikkim, you will find these huge clusters of flowers. And the result which we got was that, uh, you know, uh, every life form has its own uh, pattern along the elevation gradient. So trees would peak somewhere around 1000 meter, shrubs would peak somewhere around, uh, maximum shrubs you will find somewhere around uh, 2500 meters to 4000 meters. Climbers, light trees you will find maximum at the tropical elevations around 1000 meter, but the herbs, Maximum herbs in Sikkim are found somewhere around 3,500 to 4,000 meters. Now, uh, generally the mistake which we do, and this was published in Journal of Plant Research. So the mistake which earlier studies did was 
they arrived at the cumulative form so uh, this is the non endemic species uh, the non filled portion the white dots which you see and the black dots which you see over here are the endemic species now if we club all the life forms then the picture would appear something different uh, if we see this maximum species the non endemic species you will find around 1500 meters and the endemic species you will find around 3500 meters what we did was that we said in this paper that actually uh, one should not look at the total picture one should look at the picture for respective life forms so you whenever you sample try to sample according to the life forms because every life form will peak in a different manner so the life forms behaves in a very different manner in the himalaya so it's never advisable to you know uh, arrive at a generalized picture so even the scale uh, uh, we did a very uh, unique kind of thing uh, very simple but unique kind of thing what we did was uh, we first we attempted to just document 1000 meter elevation band so we sampled from 200 meters to uh, 300 meters to 1200 meters and then we increased our sampling gradient from 300 meters to Uh, around three thousand meters, and then we covered the entire sampling area. And here we find the effect of scale. If you don't sample the entire elevational gradient, the problem would be that you will not be able to arrive at the correct picture. So, if you have just sampled a topical elevation band, you will see that the species would increase and it would not decrease. Only when you sample the entire gradient of a particular study area. from topical to alpine then you will arrive at the more generalized picture then you, that will be the correct study because the moment you remove the question of scale the patterns will distort and then uh, that will not be the correct pattern now the next question was uh, just give me a second the next question was uh what is the main driving factor behind these patterns what actually drives these patterns and we uh, uh, analyze all the variables and we found that it's actually the temperature which is driving these uh, these life forms so out of all the climatic variables and the geographic variables which you have in the himalaya it's actually mean temperature which is dictating now this was a huge uh, thing which we found out because this directly relates to climate change if temperature is the main predominant driver of species richness in the himalaya that means if temperature changes the patterns would automatically change if something else was the main driving factor let's say if area was the factor because generally it's said in biodiversity that if you increase the area the species would decrease but here in sikkim we were not finding out that thing we found out that of all the variables which are present of all the geographic and climatic variables which were present over there it's actually the temperature which was driving these patterns and both for non endemic and endemic species so it it was not that it was just for endemic species so temperature is the main driving factor then in a related study we actually found out that the first thing which we which we found out earlier was that maximum species you will find at the middle portion uh, around 3000 meters when we analyzed it according to diversification age we actually find out found out that maximum old species that means species which have uh, the maximum uh, which is the most primitive species that also you will find in the areas which are at the middle elevation now we were at loss uh, for explanation of this how come most primitive species have ended up at the middle elevations in the himalaya either they would have been at the lower elevations but uh, or at the higher elevations how come they have ended up at the middle elevations in the himalaya and for all the life forms trees shrubs climbers herbs so if you go at the middle elevations in the himalaya around 3000 meter or something you will find the most primitive species a likely explanation is that uh, due to uh, you know man uh, uh, due to anthropogenic activities 
uh, uh, the primitive taxa which were present at the lower elevations have gone extinct. And at the higher elevations, they have not had the chance to colonize the higher elevations. So it's actually the middle elevations which are harboring the, harboring the most primitive species. And actually, that can also result in maximum species found at the middle elevation. Because what is that telling you? This result, what it's telling you, that since the middle elevations have the most primitive species in the Himalaya, that means it's the, also the area which has been diversifying for the longest amount of time. So now we had a more complete answer of what actually is driving the species richness patterns in the Himalaya. So please conserve the middle elevations. They harbor the most primitive species as well as they harbor the maximum amount of species. So uh, this was published in Plant Ecology and Diversity. So even the phylogenetic diversity was such like this. So again, the importance of the middle elevations come in the Himalaya. Uh, all the maximum diversity, phylogenetic diversity, will find in the middle portion. And uh, uh, so uh, we also tried to analyze uh, uh, like what is going on, uh, what actually is driving this phylogenetic diversity. Then the results, uh, the, uh, these are the results of uh, index, which is called as net relatedness index. What this is telling you at the higher elevations, it's actually clustering. That means only a few species which belong to closely related, uh, related families, they are occupying the position at the higher elevations. Whereas at the middle elevations, it's actually the competition the interspecific competition, which is driving these uh, diverse patterns. So what is happening at the higher elevations in the Himalaya, the Alpine regions, uh, since it's, it's so, uh, you know, it's so difficult to survive out there at such low temperature in the Himalaya. Uh, only few families have got this uh, capability to withstand those freezing temperatures. So it's only the few families who have been able to survive over there. Otherwise, at the middle elevations, there's no problem. It's competition which is driving these factors. So this present structure analysis, what it told was, uh, what it told us was middle elevations are important. The first summary of the uh, study was middle elevations are important in the Himalaya. They harbor the most primitive species. They harbor the maximum amount of species. And the temperature is the driving factor for these species. So then the next objective was to analyze the future. What will happen in the future? So for this, uh, I did ecological modeling, uh, what is called as uh, niche-based modeling. I used uh, species distribution modeling technique. And here, again, uh, I used the same study area because I already had the, this thing. What I did was I used, I used a GIS platform. So this is the distal elevation model of Sikkim. So this represents Sikkim. I reclassified this into 100 meter elevational bands. And then I marked my species along these elevations. So this represents, like for Rhododendron YT, these represents the location at where these species are found. So then uh, I used the data from WorldClim which has uh, data on a remote sensing platform, GIS platform, you can use that and you can use the software uh, called as Maxent, which is a species distribution modeling software. So see, uh, if you look at the picture, you'll see what is happening. Uh, present scenario, what is happening, this is the present distribution of rodent and bite. In future, if you see, there are subtle changes. This species is moving up. So there's loss of habitat. So the present habitat, habitats of rhododendron whitey are being lost in future climate change uh, scenarios in 2050. But at the same time, the species is moving up slightly. So two things were clear from this analysis. Species are moving up in the Himalaya, but at the same time, they are experiencing loss of habitat. So, uh, so these are a typical, these are typical species of, from Sikkim. This is rhododendron. 
So you see, uh, these are wide range species. So they have a huge elevational uh, gradation. So they occupy large amount of habitats. So see, uh, between current 2050 and 2070, for all the species, you will see that species are moving up, up but at the same time, they are losing their habitats. So these are primula, the, uh, this is terrazacum, and this is rhododendron. The problem comes with narrow range species, species which occupy only small habitats like Aconitum or Galtheria. So they are already occupying the alpine position. What, is, what will happen in future when the species from lower elevations would come up? Then what would happen? These species would move further up, but then they would have no AER to occupy in the future climates. So they will be the ones which will be at loss. And species which are occupying the fringe positions of the ecosystem, they are at the alpine belts, they would be the one which will likely go extinct. So all of these species, they would go extinct, who, which are at present located in the alpine conditions. And the future would be, uh, this was published in 2016, the future would be that there would be a predominance of shrubs in the Himalayan ecosystem. Herbs will be almost obliterated from the existing habitats. So at present, you see maximum herbs at the middle elevations. But with future, what will happen, most of these herbs would go extinct and the shrubs would occupy the future positions in the Himalayas. Now, the problem is that maximum herbs which are found in the Himalaya at these locations are medicinal plants. The moment these go, you will also have loss of livelihoods and loss of medicinal benefits to them. So that means climate change is going to create a havoc out there in the Himalayan ecosystem. It will, be the pre it will predominantly be shrubs and typically exotic species which will go into that. Right? So uh, almost we uh, look at the picture and we analyze that uh, one to three percent of species were going ex uh, one to three percent of geographic area for herbs would be going, and this would be occupied by shrubs. So it's almost it would almost translate to seven hundred square kilometers or something per second. Then the next question, which the reviewers asked in this paper, are there only a few species which are responding like this? That means, is there phylogenetic control? Let's say, for example, only uh, uh, a particular group of species are responding like this. So then we had to do this phylogenetic analysis and we found out actually all the species are behaving the same. There is no phylogenetic control. So all the species are moving up. All the species are losing their habitat and all of them are responding in the same way to climate change. Then. The next question was, will the existing protected area be sufficient for conservation? Now, <clears throat> this was published in Biological Conservation. This is the existing protected map area of Sikkim. And uh, one must credit Sikkim government for you know, having the highest network of protected area coverage in India. So almost 50%, more than 50% of area is protected. Uh, because we have this large uh, biosphere reserve, which is called as Kanchenjunga uh, National Park and Kanchenjunga Biosphere Reserve. So there are a total of about eight protected areas in Sikkim. So again, I relied on my ecological modeling expertise to simulate, simulate what will happen in the future. Will the existing protected area be sufficient enough? So I was looking at two scenarios. In the first scenario, uh, I was imagining that there are no protected areas in Sikkim. So this was almost akin to null hypothesis. So I was imagining there are no protected areas in Sikkim. And in the second case, I was imagining that with the existing protected areas, uh, what would be the case? So scenario one represents no protected areas. Scenario two represents the protected areas. Right? Now, these are the uh, results which we got. If you imagine no protected area, suppose the government of Sikkim was to delineate, uh, the government of Sikkim decided to abolish all the protected area boundaries and start afresh looking at the climate change picture, then they would have to cover this entire area, whatever is, into, whatever is falling into the pink uh, border over here, and they will have to classify it as protected area. But we all know this is very difficult to do. So the more practical way of doing it analyze it with respect to the existing protected area. 
So we found out that there is a need to create three more protected areas in Sikkim and expand the boundaries of three existing protected areas. If we do that, that means it would be sufficient for conservation. It would be sufficient for tackling the impact of climate change in the Himalayas. Now, whatever the, these areas which we proposed, so uh, the three protected areas which we proposed should be established in Sikkim was Yumsidong, Lachin, and Chungthang protected areas. And uh, we even gave the district-wise lat longs uh, uh, and the major areas which would lie within this uh, protected area. And then we suggested that we should extend the boundaries of Manim, Pambang Law, and Basi Rhododendron Sanctuary. So uh, this was published in Biological Conservation. So if we do that, then it would be good enough uh, for conservation. Right. But uh, remember, it's just a modeling exercise. So with models, there's a lot of uncertainty, but at least they give you the picture. So at least you can, you can start working on them. And the very interesting thing, which we also found out was that protected areas, which are big, which are already big, they, are, they would be the ones which would actually conserve the biodiversity. Protected areas which are small, like Kitam, which is just, you know, uh, uh, seven square kilometers, that would be inefficient in conservation. So why protected areas which are big, which have a large elevational extent, uh, which cover a large elevational gradation uh, are effective in conservation? Because if a species move from tropical to temperate region, and if your protected area is big, if your protected area spans from temperate to alpine, then that means it would be sufficient for conservation. So uh, uh, whenever you design protected areas in the Himalaya, always take into account that please don't design it according to some species. Like uh, in Sikkim only we have Singba rhododendron sanctuary and Basi rhododendron sanctuary. So they, for the purpose of tourism, they will serve the purpose. But actually, if you want it to conserve biodiversity, it will not serve the purpose. So instead of going for species-specific conservation, which is very uh, typical, the, typically it's the case for animal species in the Himalaya, please don't do that. Go as per the scientific expertise, go as per the scientific data which is available. So instead of focusing on the charismatic species, it's better to focus on the uh, real-time data. Okay. So what will happen in the future? In future, herbs will grow extinct, shrubs will come into picture, existing protected area would be inefficient in conservation, there is a need to redefine the conservation areas in the Himalaya, and it would be the narrow species, species which are already occupying the top positions in the Himalaya, the uppermost uh, positions in the Himalaya, which would grow extinct, and 99% of them are medicinal plant species. So yes, climate change is having an impact and will affect the livelihoods, it will affect biodiversity, it will affect all kind of things which are in the Himalaya. So uh, this concluded my uh, PhD study. And uh, if you want, you can have a look at these research publications. If you want, I will share them. So uh, over a period of like say uh, 10 years, we have, I've been able to publish these 14 species. But, you know, other than publications, publications are okay. Uh, but what I have found out with experience is that the beauty with Himalaya is that you have these beautiful species. You have this uh, potentilla, you have this Gualtaria, you have this Rosa, Primulas. Each species has its own story to tell. Uh, people who are living in Himalaya, uh, I feel they are very fortunate but very unfortunate at the same time. They are fortunate that they are able to see these stars. What we see in Delhi, we see smog, things shutting down due to smog. So much of pollution that you are smoking 30 cigarettes per day, even if you're not smoking. People in the Himalaya are really fortunate that they have been born in that kind of community. But at the same time, they're also very unfortunate because they would be the ones who would actually bear the brunt of climate change at first. So uh, things need to be done. Uh, we can only do studies and suggest the government. It's actually up to the policymakers to actually do something. And you pick one flower in the Himalaya, it will have its own story to tell. Uh, when it diversified, when it came into picture, would it be uh, present in the future or not? 
so uh, i will end up with this uh, beautiful lines of uh, uh, jamaica kinke and my difficulties were these i found each plant each new turn in the road each new turn in the weather from cold to hot and then back again each new set of boulders so absorbing so new and the newness so absorbing and i was so in need of an explanation for each thing that i was offered in tears struggling myself with question such as what i am and what is the thing in front of me so with that i end up this uh, short presentation not short presentation it was a really long presentation but i thank you for bearing with me i thank you for inviting me uh, people from mizoram state council and dr pradhan uh, who stayed uh, i have mostly shown in this presentation thank you all and please if there are any research questions i would be happy to answer thank you so much dr manish uh, we thank you. That was a very, I must say, it is a very important research work that you have done in your during your PhD. Mm, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, there will be an interaction time. Uh, I will just make an announcement that this is an information for all the. Um, participants that uh, there is a form to fill up it is uh, put up in the chat box so you can open and fill up uh, that form for your e-certificates and um, if there is any question uh, from the participants you can uh, kindly uh, unmute yourself and or you can on your video put on your video and directly ask the resource person i hope uh, you have questions or if you uh, want to put up in the chat box you can also do that we may uh, read it out for you so let's uh, open an interaction time <coughs> okay let me first have the first priority hey am i audible Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My name is James, and I have been doing my PhD degree on an endemic plant species in Mizoram. I would like to ask, uh, you know, like a suggestion from Dr. Manish. Uh, like, how do we, you know, um, uh, like make the population or like study the plant species or conserve the plant species, which is very narrow in habitat, like maybe within a 200 meter square meter. Have you ever heard of a dancing girl belonging to the family Gingeresi? Yeah. So um, like, it will be really difficult. Uh, it will be really difficult for, you know, uh, other than ex situ conservation techniques, uh, I don't yeah. think in situ would serve any purpose over there. So unless you take a group of species and try to conserve them, and typically uh, not species what I uh, have experienced uh, from my field studies, uh, if you conserve the habitats, the species would automatically conserve, automatically be but, conserved. But so, sir, in this case, uh, the habitat could not be conserved because yeah. it is all along the roadside and yeah. uh, it is, a, you know, uh, a, land cut area and the, most of the soils is like clay yeah. type and um, it's so, very difficult to conserve the area yeah so, yeah so i think ex situ conservation would be the most effective technique over there uh, because in situ would hardly serve any purpose i have tried tried to collect those rhizomes from the place yeah. and try to you know, different methods in my own garden, but mm -hmm. I have failed terribly. So <laughs> I'm just asking for you. Yeah. Uh, therefore, I think they are so, uh, you know, so habitat specific. It's very difficult to yeah. recreate their habitats. And uh, therefore, they are such narrow range species. And, uh, you know, the moment there's some minor alteration in the habitat, now, uh, be it with, with respect to uh, temperature, or with, with, be it with respect to precipitation or even humidity. 
so that species will be gone so again that highlights the same uh, point about climate change in the himalaya uh, uh, so many species uh, which have such a narrow distribution minor change minor alteration in the habitat and they will be gone but i was amazed to see that in such a narrow range it has survived yeah. still it around has... 100 her years yes. still 100 years yeah, yeah. the first yeah. recorded was say, about 90 years ago so yeah that's that's the beauty of the himalaya you take one flower and it it has a different uh, history than the flower which is just lying lying around it so that's the beauty of himalayan flowers yeah i'm still yeah <clears throat> thank you yeah thank you thank you dr james for your question so well, any more questions coming up Okay, let me add uh, another point. My name is Lal Thanpuya. I'm uh, I work in the state climate change cell. So <clears throat> I'm not a botany expert, but I just need to ask uh, Dr. Mani. It's a very I don't know. It may be a very blunt question, but uh, you have a outstanding presentation that uh, I greatly appreciate it. Mm. my question is uh sikkim like you have a uh, alpine supple pine zone like you have a full range of elevation but here in mizoram uh, the highest elevation will be not even 3000 meters above sea level yes. so it will be between 2000 to 3000 uh, <laughs> so is there any uh, like what would you suggest like if anybody from uh, researchers or students might want to take up a uh, research to do uh, climate change uh, and biodiversity plant biodiversity in specific like uh, what can a type of uh, approach can be uh, taken up in mizoram like we have that uh, kind of uh, altitudinal gradient uh, as i've mentioned yeah so uh, basically the point is that um, um, whatever uh, you want to study uh, for a particular state so you try to sample the entire gradient of that state so even if you don't have alpine regions or sub alpine regions and uh, it's mostly the case in northeast india like i went to arunachal i saw that we end up at the temperate and the sub temperate regions there is no alpine regions over there so uh, if you want to actually do something uh, to study uh, the impacts of climate change and to do, uh, want to arrive at some idea how to conserve the biodiversity which is being impacted due to climate change just sample from your lower most portion to the higher most portion portion if it's possible another problem in the himalayas is that many points are not accessible so if it's possible somehow you just sample from the lower most point of your state to the higher most point of your state and that would give you a complete picture never mind if it doesn't have any you know uh, any uh, alpine or the sub alpine regions even the tropical if it's entirely tropical even that would suffice the cause great yes uh, uh i'll add another point yeah, it's not a question actually yes i'm speaking on behalf of the state climate change cell and uh, the purpose of this uh, webinar uh, is to uh, uh see look at that uh, if there is any slightest chance that uh, uh, the parties from the participants they might want to Uh, they might uh, acquire some interest in the kind of study you have done or any uh, plant biodiversity and climate change research so that is the purpose of it so i'd like to uh, invite uh, each and every participants if you have any uh, questions or some comments uh, please feel free to speak uh, we have i think we have time if the host permitted so please feel free to comment or give any questions uh okay uh, uh i have small uh, uh, things to you know tell uh, actually to dr manish um, 
Actually, your entire study is based in Sikkim. And uh, since um, I, am, uh, uh, I am also a researcher in Sikkim, I have been uh, doing research in Sikkim last 15 years. Okay, so um, I've been uh, studying the regeneration patterns and all which are now, now at the time I, I, I am seen as the climate advocate. I am an environment, seen as an environmentist, but my background is botany, okay? So then um, uh, you talked about, uh, I have, I. I had when uh, I'd gone through the paper which uh, you and uh, uh, Professor Pandit had published in, in respect to you know where you have um, you know uh, uh, recommended to increase the uh, like you know protected areas in Sikkim. But from from a Sikkimist perspective, from a Sikkimist point of view, you know. Mm-hmm. Now you have mentioned uh, like, you know, uh, Yume Samdung. Yume Samdung, it is already a protected area. There is no need to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 declare it as a protected area because there is no habitation. And as far as Chungthang is concerned, it's a, Chungthang is such a place where there is a confluence of Lachung and Lachin River and there is habitations and there is ongoing this um, hydropower projects. So uh, Chungthang, uh, you know, you, it cannot be declared as the protected area, though we have the reserve forest, you know. And um, then another point is that that now our uh, Sikkim is very small place. We have only seven zero nine six square kilometer, and is, uh, as you say, we have uh, we have an um, uh, overall distance of one hundred sixteen kilometer from north to south, and sixty four kilometer from east to west. Okay, we and um, we are facing a problem, uh, lots of problem. Like you know, uh, this population is increasing. Uh, we are having lots of influx and we are now short of area for you know uh, our uh, uh, people we are uh, we do not have area you know now uh, infl- uh, population increase means we need more areas to uh, settle our people but we are having uh, you know um, uh, um, we are in a problem because we do not have the area so now at that time also i went through the paper and i was you know in a uh, i was uh, planning to you know write a criticism for your paper for that paper but uh, but unfortunately because of my this um, tight schedule i couldn't do it but uh, the suggestions which has uh, come from uh, you know from your point that is um, agreeable but it it cannot be you know uh, like you know it cannot be implemented uh, i hope you understand this and mm-hmm. uh, yeah right yeah the so, whole point of research is to... in as a researcher and as a researcher you you i am as a researcher uh, you see from your perspective but as a uh, local people we, we have to think from the uh, uh, local people's pers- perspective also you know when as i said uh, already said we have we are in sort of area and again you know expanding the boundaries of the existing protected areas then at then where the people will go, grow and will go because now the climate is changing and there is upward movement, upward shift of, um, upward shift of, of the plants as well as the um, humans also. You know, the, the people from the plains are climbing up into the mountains. Now there are uh, lots of people coming into the Sikkim, you know. So these are the problems. So uh, uh, that is uh, what I have observed, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the whole idea of research or research writing is to inculcate these debates. So we would have been very happy if uh, uh, even uh, if you could not have published the criticism, you could have written it back to us. Basically, Mm. what what uh, we argue is that please don't approach, please don't propose the protectionist approach while defining your protection. So uh, if you define everything and snatch away the rights of the local people, that will not be the option. I agree with you. It's better to involve the local people, try to conserve out there, give them the ownership rights. Don't snatch away the ownership rights. Don't approach a blanket ban on every right over there in the Himalaya. So now this has been shown by a lot of people that if you go and snatch away the rights of the local people and transfer it to Department of Forest and Wildlife, then that would not serve the cause of conservation. You have to involve local people. You have to give them property rights. You will have to co-manage it rather than... You take the example of Nepal, Kailash sacred uh, uh, conservation area, how beautifully they are managing it. So... uh, if that is to be replicated in the Himalaya, then uh, that would be the s- same purpose. You can't go on conserving just plant and no- and leave out the tribal people out there. So I absolutely agree with you. The study was just like you said, Yumsidong is is already a protected area because there is no habitat. But then uh, why not declare it? What's the problem in declaring it as a protected area? Then as you are saying, people have to go up. Fine, declare it as a protected area. Just limit 
uh, any kind of activity which will damage the plant biodiversity and allow all the other kind of activities which is actually being done in Kanchenjunga Biosphere Reserve. So that is my take. We have the, you know, we have our own uh, takes on different matters. But yeah, I appreciate your concern about this. Uh, uh, our idea was only to suggest a way, but uh, we did not say that uh, go for the protectionist approach, what is uh, being defined in protected areas nowadays. And um, I think the Department of Forest and Wildlife in any state of Himalaya are not, they are actually giving the rights to the local communities out there and telling them to conserve. If you go to Pake Tiger Reserve in Arunachal, they are even doing the same. Uh, the state of Arunachal Pradesh is not directly involved and they have done a beautiful job in conservation of tigers over there in Pakhe Tigers. So, so that is my take, I think. Yeah, that is uh, that is okay. But, uh, you know, like um, uh, now you may something area as we talk, these are very close to uh, this uh, China China border. You know, it is only five kilometers from there to, to China border, you know. So uh, it will not always be feasible to, you know, uh, 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 declare such kind of areas, you know, uh, which are politically very sensitive areas as a protected area. It should be, it should not be away from the disturbances, you know, any kind of disturbances may happen like, you know, we have a Singba Road in the sanctuary in the North Sikkim, you know, uh, now in the, within the sanctuary, actually, uh, no activities are allowed. But um, what happens in our case is that army, you know, army people, they, uh, you know, they do trainings inside the sanctuaries, you know, that cannot be uh, for the sake of, you know, uh, for the sake of conservation, we cannot, you know, uh, now we cannot uh, put the, the, uh, our borders at least, you know, those, this kind of problems are there. So while, you know, um, there are many, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, things which uh, we need to um, uh, understand and take into account and of course yes i also do believe that we need to we need to involve the people which is uh, which never happened in sikkim and uh, now uh, for being in the forest department um, I, I being in the forest department i am constantly raising these issues with the forest department you know so um, let's hope i think uh, in the future uh, something uh, will come up but um, uh, these are the issues now we cannot uh, you know expand our protected areas because we have the highest uh, 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 this, uh, uh, you know, uh, as compared to the area, if you compare it to the area, we have highest number of protected areas, you know, in in yeah. in, in Indian context also. Yeah, yeah. So even, I think fifty-two like percent of your area is protected, so that's big amount as compared to any of this. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Anyway, that was just my suggestion. It's not, no, uh, no, to, yes. you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, you see, Dr. Pradhan, anywhere in India, uh, uh, the protected area approach has not worked unless you give the ownership rights to the local people. Yes, yes, they, yes. they are the ones who will live out there. Nobody destroys their own home. So they will not destroy anything which is uh, lying in their homes. So this has to be the go forward approach from uh, like in the future with the case of Himalaya. Yeah, true. Okay, okay thank you anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradhan. Yes, thank you, Dr. Pradhan. Thank you, Dr. Manish. So do we have any questions uh, from the other participants? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. One last question. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I would like to ask, like, uh, Mizoram is situated from, like, having many international boundaries between Bangladesh and Myanmar, the sea level is from around 70 to 30,000 meters above sea level. So I would like to ask Dr. <clears throat> Sorry. I would like to have Dr. Manish, like, what do you suggest to take up studies in terms of methodology for our research scholars, especially on climate change related with plant diversity in a subtropical like our country, like our state? Yeah, the, the problem with, you know, any kind of climate change study, people always criticize uh, 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 biodiversity people who do mm -hmm. climate change study is that they don't have enough data. They just have data for mm -hmm. three years. Whereas if you see the definition of climate change, climate mm -hmm. change will can only be 
if you have done for three years. So mm. now, either in ideal circumstances, what should happen? You you have cell which would record data uh, for almost thirty years or something. Uh, then you will have an empirical data. Otherwise, you will have to rely on the forecast data, which is available from the DCMs, general circulation models. So, what I would do for the what I would suggest for the research scholars is that if you want to perform any climate change study, uh, it can't be performed within a matter of two years or five years. So, you will need to use the GCM data, and GCM data freely available nowadays from the IPCC platforms. So you take the GCM data, general circulation model data for Mizoram, extract that data for your particular study area for the state of Mizoram. It's possible to do so for in remote sensing, and then you go in the field and record the species. You take a GPS with you and record the latitudes and longitudes of your species. Then you relate that species location with the existing climate data. Once you build a relationship, let's say at 20 degrees centigrade, the species is present at this uh, latitude and longitude. Now, when you have this relationship, uh, then if you change 20 to 25 degrees centigrade, let's say in future climate change scenarios, which is again available from the IPCC platform, temperature changes to 22 degrees centigrade. So, if you have a relationship build up in the current climate, then if you change 20 to 22 the latitudes will automatically be predicted so the best way if you want to do a climate change study would be to go for modeling study because unless you have data for 30 years you can't define climate change so go in the field take a gps with you record the species locations come back uh, learn some ecological modeling uh, learn how to extract data from the ipcc database for your state related to the current climate and then project it for the future climate using ecological modeling techniques so that is the way in which i think you should go ahead <clears throat> yes sir that's very insightful yes, and the staff be he or us as me yeah doctor yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in one of your paper you have cited so many things about the prehistorical data and like mm -hmm. different uh, endemic species from sikkim mm -hmm. and it was cited from jd hooker uh, right gbif yeah global biodiversity information no 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 those floral elevation data oh okay uh, so those are the latitude and longitude data which we had collected from the field no 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 those previous one the last one from jd hooker okay okay flora of british india yeah 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 so how did jd hooker recorded all those data from the uh, no uh, uh, like, data all those things yeah at the or, at the yeah at the start of the lecture i said that uh, uh, basically you can't record all this data so you have to rely on already published data now it might be possible that many of those species must have gone extinct or uh, they are uh, you know uh, species uh, which are synonyms so uh, uh, that is one of the limitations which all the of these publications have that we have not verified each and every data we have just been able to collect field data for i think uh, 1100 endemics whereas the paper included data for 3300 endemics so so uh, it's just one third of species which we have actually verified from the field so that is one of the major limitation and the problem with the indian uh, records is that other than flora of british india you don't have a complete taxonomic record which is there uh, for all the families in the himalayas so uh, botanical survey of india have some some families um, but then uh, the list is not complete so for complete list of species we had to rely on flora of british india which i accept is a very major limitation in these studies many of these must have been synonyms many of these species one way to correct for that was that we looked at the uh, the plant list database 
and saw uh, we saw if there are any um, species which uh, have already been classified as synonyms over there so the plant list is the most comprehensive database which you have or the royal botanical garden database so uh, the synonyms we try to correct for control for by through that method but other than that i accept it's a very major limitation in our study what i want to want to know is that how how come those elevation data that during those jd hooker data or maybe the christian this yeah 1880s or something yeah something like that those were all already in the queue herbarium yeah uh, 18 there, nothing was there in the, <laughs> nothing was there in the kolkata herbarium <laughs> no they 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 all have been recorded <laughs> they have all been kept in the queue herbarium but thank yeah. you if you see the flora of british <laughs> india they have given you the elevations at, at which they are found so <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, uh, can I suggest one thing? Yeah. Maybe uh, the state climate change cell or the Mizoram University or any colleges, if they're interested, maybe we can start working. Uh, basically, means we can start basic like uh, documentation, monitoring of database, That's, something like yeah. that. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, you know, for the purpose of uh, looking at the impacts of climate change in the future. Yeah. yeah i i think that is the uh, uh, that is the uh, point at which we lack because we have not uh, uh, been able to uh, you know prepare our own databases so we always have to rely on the databases which are available uh, uh, in other countries so that's the problem even if you look at flora of china so you go to the e flora china website they have data from arunachal they have data from sikkim but we have uh, we ourselves don't have any database so that is uh, i think the first step which should be uh, done uh, at the you know primary level so that would be a record for the future also so database generation and record keeping is one of the most important steps uh, i would like to add uh, one thing here now see uh, 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 india is implementing this indian biological diversity act 2002 you know and as per the act we are to uh, constitute biodiversity management committees um, in every villages or in every gpos you know which we are been doing uh, throughout india and uh, the uh, foremost uh, you know the responsibility of the bmc is to prepare the people's biodiversity register you know people's biodiversity register and um, that is being you know uh, the preparation of which is being undertaken at massive level because the um, uh, national green tribunal has passed you know has given an order to complete it um, uh, as early as possible otherwise the state will have to pay 10 lakh rupees fine per month you know so because of that now every state has undertaken the um, this uh, documentation of um, you know uh, um, uh, documenting everything in the people's biodiversity register now we are now uh, uh, every state is having their own databases now um, only thing is that we need to make it more scientific you know we need to just it's not uh, only about documentation but we need to make it more scientific for that uh, you know scientific personal uh, the biodiversity management committees local communities can take the help of the researchers and all you know so that we have our database uh, in place you know for future reference and so that is an ongoing process so thank you Okay, thank you, Dr. Pradhan. Um, uh, we will uh, close the interaction for now. Um, if we have any more questions, I think our resource persons can they can give us their uh, email address, and then we can contact them later also. Yeah, so I will write my email address in the chat box in case somebody is interested to. You know, yes, sir. Uh, thank you. and if uh, dr pradhan can also do that um, we would be very grateful okay, okay so uh, before, we... leaving, before leaving i'll uh, like to ask one question it's to dr manish and dr ba, uh, pradhan my question to dr manish is that uh in out here in mizoram what we uh, not in the field of botany but in the field of herpetology what we have seen is that many of the species migrated downward oh. instead of uh, upward so what could be the reason for that uh, are they uh, are you talking about uh, uh, hypertrophic amphibians yeah uh, in yeah mainly in reptiles like right. this uh, black crate mm -hmm. mountain pit viper and all 10 uh, 15 years back we 
most of them, most of majority of the population, mm-hmm. we found above 1,000 meter, but mm-hmm. now they've come down instead of up. What could be the reason for that? Uh, that is uh, that is really interesting because because as in Sikkim, no, when now we are uh, we are uh, recording this cobra, king cobra, in higher elevations like seventeen hundred to eighteen hundred meter above sea level. You know? So uh, migration uh, to uh, downwards is uh, uh, really interesting, uh, interesting topic. Uh, but uh, I I am not sure why it is happening. Maybe uh, 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 climatic conditions, or maybe you know they are. Uh, uh, the habitat is um, degrading or maybe because of the pollutions you know there may be many factors may, there may be forest you know uh, uh, degradation of the forest health those things could be uh, could be the major you know, uh, reason um, um, uh, i feel you know uh, yeah one more question for the problem how can we define between uh, this migration because of climate change and migration due to economic reasons because See, majority uh, of the Migration, which you've seen from our state yeah, to yeah. other places due to economic reasons instead of climate change. So how do we draw mm-hmm. the line See, the, between this difference? Uh, now, uh, I feel both are uh, both are interlinked, you know, because of the climate change. Now the um, uh, crop production is diminishing. You know, there is water stress, and p- now people are trying to escape those uh, disasters, and they are moving towards the uh, areas. And because of the uh, this, um, uh, you know, uh, climate anomalies and all, there is no opportunity. So people are, uh, you know, uh, uh, attracted towards the urban areas due to uh, uh, in in search of the uh, opportunity that is happening in most of the northeastern states. But um, uh, but in other in, uh, in, uh, like um, Africa and um, you know Egypt and all now people are migrating because the um, this climate are becoming very uh, climate are becoming very worse and they are not able to you know uh, withstand those uh, climatic uh, in uh, changing climate so they are migrating towards the uh, Europe and all and uh, not only for food but they are also migrating uh, uh, you know in search of job and you know food security you know so either way you know uh, these both are interlinked. Okay, okay. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vanuchima, for your question. Okay, now we shall re- uh, now request U Samuel Lerma Soma, Senior Scientific Officer, to give a concluding remark. Um, thank you, Mimi. I hope I'm, I'm audible. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, I'll not take much time now. We have uh, come to the end of our webinar tonight. So, uh, as mentioned in the welcome address, the climate change business in our state is uh, taken uh, under the Environment, Forest, and Climate Change Department. And under uh, their guidance, we have completed the first phase of our uh, state as internal climate change, which was during 2013 uh, to 2017. Now, another state as internal is coming up, uh, which is yet is to be approved, and it will be up to 2030. And uh, the, our state climate change cell uh, under this uh, science and technology is working on the knowledge aspect, as they have said, with capacity building, building and awareness as one of the main activity. So our mandate is uh, to build the capacity of uh, various stakeholders as much as possible. And now we have completed five years and are looking towards uh, to a more knowledge uh, generation activities that will bring about uh, better adaptation and mitigation measures uh, for the state. And on coming to uh, Dr. Pradhan's uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Pradhan, your presentation was uh, very informative, uh, giving us a glimpse of what is happening in our world right now and uh, what practical solutions are there. As indicated in your uh, presentation, the last decade was indeed uh, the hottest years. Uh, we also feel it very much from our state too. And if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, the hottest day recorded was uh, in April 2018 for our state. I think it was about 38 degrees. And as you have said, uh, the global war is uh, really against the climate change. Uh, you could even, we could even see in uh, some internet website that uh, this climate change could be one of the reasons that the world could come to an end. <laughs> I also agree uh, and would like to stress uh, that what seems to be a small act like 
not wasting our food, uh, following the three R's, uh, such as the reduce, reuse, recycle, they should not be taken for granted. Uh, uh, the participants uh, of tonight's webinar, uh, we, uh, also we, we may not be able to do great things for our climate uh, that is changing, but we can try and act and do uh, what seems to be uh, small acts like uh, these things, like as I said, not wasting our food and all these uh, small things. And Dr. Uh, Radhan, we really appreciate your project in Sikkim, uh, which is a uh, restore uh, river ecosystem. And uh, as in your last slide, uh, we'd very uh, much like to join your campaign also. Uh, I'd like to mention that our state council, Science and Technology Council, is also working and in good relationship with your uh, Sikkim State Science and Technology Council. <clears throat> and we really do hope that we'll keep in touch and work together in future too in, uh, in this uh, climate change and environmental aspects. <clears throat> Now on coming to Dr. Kumar Mani's uh, presentation, which is impacts of climate on Himalayan uh, land diversity. It is very uh, interesting and much uh, thought provoking. Uh, if taken us back to the continental drift theory, vis-a-vis uh, -vis endemism of our species in the Himalayan region, I believe that your findings on species by the by biodiversification, which started with uh, the uh, starting of the monsoon in the Himalayan region and the species difference between the Western and Himalayan, Western Himalayan, Eastern Himalayas uh, and the impacts. I think uh, they must be one of the uh, best findings uh, towards uh, this research area. And uh, I feel that we are very fortunate to have a resource person who is working on the Himalayan mountain region of which our state, uh, Mizoram is also uh, very much a part of it. As mentioned uh, by you, I think we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, to live in this beautiful Himalayan region, even though our knowledge system is still very low as compared to the mainland people uh, towards this uh, conservation of its resources. So uh, I'll, I'll come to the last part of my uh, comment. Uh, I'd like to dwell a little, uh, say a little bit about our state in our state, uh, you see, uh, we still don't have a uh, good inventory or of our bioresources, our plants, uh, our animal species, uh, and proper documentation and classification are very much needed. Uh, and there are many uh, research areas and focus uh, that could be taken up based on our state resources alone. So this is a very, a quite a <coughs> big challenge. And, um, as others also, we are also facing uh, erratic rainfall, water scarcity, droughts, uh, less uh, forest cover, increase uh, water bond diseases, uh, vector bond diseases also, and uh, shifting of plant species and all the likes. I think we really have to keep uh, vigil of these aspects. So my comment uh, would end on that. And now on the last part, uh, I'd like to propose a little uh, short word of thanks, uh, which goes through our uh, chief scientific officer, our engineer is also Milena, who has uh, taken his time, uh, precious time <clears throat> tonight, uh, saying the welcome note. And of course, to our resource persons, Dr. Bharat Pradhan and Dr. Manish Kumar, as I have said, your presentations are very uh, informative, thought provoking, and very outstanding too. And I'd like to thank the participants from uh, various departments, especially the uh, Department of Forest and Climate Change and the other institutions from uh, science, and science institutions like uh, Patsun College, Sechi uh, College, uh, Lungli College, and all the other colleges too. And tonight we have also participation from uh, Biocon. Uh, <clears throat> their president, uh, Mr. Vanotima, was the, I think, the last person who was the questions. And we have also participation from Science Teachers Association Mizoram, uh, Mizoram Academy of Sciences and Mizoram Science Society also. And last but not the least, I'd like to thank our collaborator, Government Certificate College, and our wonderful host, Mimi Shasil. So lastly, uh, in the coming months, uh, we are trying to have uh, another webinar on climate change and animal biodiversity 
uh, I really do hope that we'll join hands again and uh, have another wonderful webinar. And I do hope that all the participants tonight will again participate uh, in this uh, climate change and animal biodiversity uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pusamuel. On behalf of my college, I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude towards Mystic for letting us collaborate with you in this auspicious webinar. I tr uh, it is truly a pleasure working with you. So coming to the end of the program, um, I request all the participants, if you can um, turn on your video, uh, we can uh, take a picture of all the participants along with the resource persons for our documentation. So participants, please uh, turn on your video. There are many beautiful faces out there. <laughs> <clears throat> Some look sleepy. I think everyone should remove the mask. Everyone should remove the mask, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Is it finished? Um, I have taken the um, mm -hmm. second page. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just a minute. Okay, it's done. Okay, thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. And good night, um, all of you. Good night. Uh, good thank night. you. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, see you again. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Good night, everyone.